Well, this morning we are in Acts 21. We pick up the narrative that Luke gives us. Paul's travels uh, to Jerusalem. And um, we're going to look um, uh, at this and also what happens at the various churches that they meet along the way. And what almost seems to be a conflict of what the disciples are telling Paul through the Holy Spirit. And yet what Paul knows the Spirit of God has already revealed to him. Let me begin by reading the, the passage and again the overall theme. And I, and I should mention that we are going to spend about half the sermon on the itinerary. So don't get distracted. Uh, it's very interesting. But the main thing we want to look at is what comes in the second part, which is his submission to God's will. Okay, so Acts 21, beginning in verse 1. Luke writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When we had parted from them, that is from the elders of Miletus and so forth, and had set sail, we ran a straight course to Coes, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey. While they all with wives and children escorted us until we were out of the city, after kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home again. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. And as we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming up to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we, as well as all the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. Well, may the Lord bless this passage to our understanding this morning. Now, last week, remember, the Spirit was really pointing to us, pointing us to four things um, through the passage we looked at, four things that he is working in us that will help us better to serve our Lord. Now, the first three of them came from Paul's personal example. Remember, first, that he had a servant's heart. I, I think all of us, as we read about Paul, see that he was one who gave himself to the Lord unreservedly. And in doing so, gave himself also to serve God's people. He pushed through every obstacle, even the trials that he had to face at the hands of the Jews in order to serve the Ephesians. Now, he knew that Jesus Christ had done the same thing. In his redemptive work, Jesus had to push through many obstacles. And he also knew that Jesus was continuing to serve him from heaven. We think about Jesus as king and he rules and reigns. But let's not forget, he is also our priest who continues to intercede for us. And he is our prophet who reveals his will to us for our good. And so Paul here is simply following his Lord's example in being a servant. And of course, the Spirit of God is working the same kind of a heart and spirit within us. Now, secondly, that he had the willingness to pay even the ultimate price in his, servant, his service to the Lord. He has set his heart on going wherever it was that the Spirit of God was leading him, even if it meant he had to lay down his life. Now again, he knew that his Lord had given his life for him. 
And so because of that sacrifice, which the Lord's table reminds us of this morning, Paul was compelled also to give his life to Jesus. Now we're going to see more of that this morning as he continues steadfastly towards Jerusalem. But again, let's not forget, this is what the Spirit of God is working within us. The willingness to lay down our lives, to pay the ultimate price for our service to Christ. Third, he was also faithful in his gospel witness. Remember, he had not failed to use every opportunity the Lord had given him to share his message so that he could honestly say that if anyone perished, it wouldn't be because of him, but in spite of him. Again, Jesus was faithful to preach the gospel to everyone he met, everyone he saw, and so Paul was striving to be the same by the same Spirit and, of course, the Spirit of God is working this within us. This is the difficult part. But this is what he desires, and this is what he gives us the grace to do, and this is what he gives us the desire to do. Now, finally, we saw the warning the Spirit gave Paul, through Paul, to the Ephesian elders, that false teachers would not only infiltrate the church, come from without to go within, but would also rise from within it. And so as Jesus had faithfully taught his disciples for those three and a half years, both to help them to grow and to protect them from error, so Paul had done for these elders, and so the elders must now do for their flock. Now that is the reason. By the way, Paul says, I'm free from the blood of all men because I have not failed to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He said that on more than one occasion to the Ephesian elders. And let me just simply say, that's why here we're not content merely to have devotional sermons, you know, self-help sermons, sermons that make people feel good. Devotional thoughts may be important, but they're not enough. We need everything that the Lord has given to us. And that's why we want the whole counsel of God. That's why we want to go through everything that He says and not miss anything. And by the way, that is also why we need each other. Because we all know too well how long our memories last of what we hear of what's going on in the mornings. I mean, I experience the same thing myself. We need each other to encourage each other to remember and to apply what it is that we hear from God's Word, from Lord's Day to Lord's Day. The author to the Hebrews, that's what he meant when he said to his audience or wrote to them, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we, we need to remember these things so that we can apply them and do them. Now this morning we see Paul continuing his journey towards Jerusalem with his companions. Luke, who is now with them, gives to us the details. And again, this is one of the reasons why we see uh, or believe that Luke is the author of this, of this uh, book of Acts as well as the, um, the gospel of, of Luke because he, he uses the vocabulary of, of an educated man, of somebody who took note of the details. I don't know if you ever noticed, but Luke gives us a, a lot of details. He's, he's the one who gives us the longest gospel. And he, he seems not to miss a point, especially when he is traveling with Paul, okay? Now, since he does this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't assume that any of this is superfluous, that it doesn't have a reason, you know, there's no purpose for it, but it, that it does have a purpose. I remember in seminary class that uh, Mark Furtado was looking with us at a passage in, uh, I believe it was either Ezra or Nehemiah, I think it was in Nehemiah, it's where they're rebuilding the walls, that is definitely in Nehemiah. And it gives a list of the people who were building the wall. And he says, was this list here for no reason? You know, what, what is the reason for this list? And he had an interesting uh, interpretation and application of it. This list was to show us that God uses ordinary people to fulfill his purpose and his will. Everybody in the city was involved in building the wall. And so all of God's people should be involved in building the kingdom of heaven. Well, these details also have a purpose. And, and basically, what, what is that purpose? Uh, 
Well, let's, let's take a look at, at some of these places and what was unique about them. So after they left Miletus, they first reached a place called Kos. Kos is a small island that is due south of Miletus, off the coast of Asia Minor, about a six-hour voyage. It was famous for its worship of Aesculapius. I'm sure we all know who Aesculapius is, the Greek god of medicine. And also Juno, which is not a city in Alaska, but the wife of Jupiter, of course, fictitious god, and the goddess of protection. Interestingly, this is where Hippocrates was born. Hippocrates is the person who is known as the father of modern medicine. It's interesting, he was born on an island that was famous for its worship of Aesculapius. Perhaps that's because of Hippocrates. From there, they traveled to Rhodes, okay, another island that's 50 miles to the southeast of Kos. And on the island of Rhodes, there was a city by the same name that was distinguished for its huge brass statue of the Greek sun god Helios. It was built to commemorate the city's victory over Demetrius I, the Macedonian, when he attacked the city. Now, the statue basically at least before Paul's time, straddled uh, the mouth of the harbor. So basically, you had to pass between the statue's legs in order to get into the harbor, but the statue was so tall that it could easily be done. Uh, by the way, this statue was also known as the Colossus of Rhodes. Perhaps you've, you've heard that. And it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It stood for 56 years, before an earthquake broke the statue at, at its knees and it fell onto the land in 226 BC. So in Paul's day, as he's entering through the harbor at Rhodes, it lay prostrate next to the mouth of the harbor where it would remain for 600 more years. So basically lay there for about 800 years. Now I can't help but think that as Paul saw this, this idol basically prostrate on the ground, that he must have thought about the Philistine statue of Dagon, remember? When they brought the Philistines, captured the ark and brought it into the temple of Dagon. And when they came there the next day, the statue of Dagon had fallen on the ground and it was prostrate before the ark of the covenant. Uh, how he must have been thinking the kingdom of heaven as it, as it advances is bringing about the subjection and the destruction of, of all idols. Now from there they went to Patera, which is due east of Rhodes. And Patera was known for its temple and oracle of Apollo that had resided there. I tried to find some information on whether there was more than one oracle and, and whether the oracle was still operating at that time. But the only thing I could find out is that this temple and oracle was second historically only to the temple and oracle that was at Delphi. You know, the oracle of Delphi, we often hear about that in, in ancient uh, culture. Now, we're really not told what Paul did in any of these cities. You know, the, the ship that he was traveling on pretty much hung close to the coast and was likely following the trade routes. But we should assume that Paul spoke to everyone that he met about their need of the Savior. And we can also imagine that as he looked at these relics of idolatry, that he couldn't help but see how God's kingdom was bringing all of these to an end. And ultimately, that's what the Bible says. God's kingdom is going to destroy all idolatry, all false worship, and there will be only in the end one true worship or one true religion. Now from there, they boarded a ship to Phoenicia, which was the longer stretch of the voyage located along the coast of Syria, north of Palestine. As they sailed, they passed by Cyprus. It was to their left, which means they traveled south of the island. And this is where Paul went on his first missionary journey, landing at one side of the island and making his way all the way across, preaching the gospel. And as Paul was traveling past the island, again, I don't think it's any stretch of the imagination to think that Paul was thinking about the church and how they were doing and prayed for their well-being. Then they landed in Tyre, which is in Phoenicia, uh, Tyre, remember, is the city that Alexander the Great's troops basically tore down and scraped from the ground and threw into the ocean in 332 B.C. They used it to build a causeway uh, 
because as they laid siege to the city, they didn't realize that being a coastal city with an island off the coast that all the inhabitants of the city had basically fled to the island. And so when they finally took the city, they realized nobody was in it. They saw the people were on the island and they thought they were safe. And so Alexander had his men tear down the walls of the city and everything in it and basically cast it into the ocean, build a causeway to the island, and he, he took it. But here, the ship basically unloaded its cargo. They must have done some rebuilding from the time that Tyre was scraped off the land. By the way, there's an interesting Old Testament prophecy that basically says exactly that before it took place. The tire would be torn down and scraped from the land and cast into the ocean. And I can imagine the prophets reading that prophecy at that time had no idea what that could have possibly meant. And then as they see it taking place, realize, of course, this was spoken by a prophet of God, and God is the one who is in control. Now, while they were there, they searched out the church that had been established by the disciples that fled Jerusalem after Stephen was stoned. That's how the gospel got to Tyre. And having found them, they stayed there for seven days. From Tyre, they again boarded the ship and sailed to Ptolemaeus, again named after one of the Ptolemy rulers. And there they greeted the brethren and stayed for a day. And finally, at least for our passage this morning, they arrived at Caesarea, a city 70 miles northwest of Jerusalem, named by Herod the Great who built it after Caesar Augustus. And there they stayed with Philip for several days. Now again, this itinerary helps us to understand at least a little bit of what the world looked like in Paul's day, as well as what must have been on his heart as he looked at all this, again, the relics of idolatry, that God's kingdom would grow and eventually supplant the kingdom of the evil one so that only the kingdom of God remains. That's essentially what uh, the vision that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar, that Daniel interpreted, the stone cut without hands, it smashes the feet of the statue, it topples over, it shatters, turns into dust, the wind blows it away, and then the stone grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. One day the kingdom of heaven is going to fill the entire earth and do away with all these other kingdoms. Now, as I've said, that was basically the first half, the second half, is, is this, the, basically the lesson we want to look at that I've been aiming at this morning. It shows us, again, Paul's resolve to go to Jerusalem. But since we looked at that last time, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But also the struggle that these believers were having in letting Paul go, in basically surrendering to God's will. Now, Luke told us earlier that when they arrived at Tyre, they looked for the disciples, and when they found them, they stayed there for seven days. And while they were there, these disciples kept telling Paul, in verse 4, through the Spirit, not to set foot in Jerusalem. Now, it almost sounds like the Spirit of God is basically saying that what Paul's doing is a fool's errand, and he shouldn't be going there. Why would the Spirit tell Paul to go there? But then the Spirit tells these people to tell Paul not to go there, okay? Well, we shouldn't understand this as the Spirit of God telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem, okay? Because he's already told Paul that's where he needed to go and what was going to happen to him there. Rather, we should see that the Spirit had revealed to these disciples what was going to happen to Paul. And because they loved him so much, they just couldn't find it in their hearts to let him go. They didn't want to see him suffer. They didn't want to see him arrested. They didn't want to lose him. Now, I think we see more of this deep affection when it came time to let Paul go. It says they all escorted him out to the outskirts of the city. They went with their whole families, with their wives and their children. They all knelt down together to pray with Paul. And I can imagine Paul prayed for them, but they may have prayed for him as well. I'm sure they did, that God might have mercy on him and spare him and protect him. And the reason is because, again, they loved him. The same thing happened when they, when they arrived at Caesarea and were staying with Philip. Now, remember, Philip was one of the seven, one of the seven originally chosen. Remember, after the day of Pentecost and all those people in Jerusalem and how the disciples were selling their possessions and they were distributing to everyone who had need. And 
how the, the Greeks came up and said our widows are being overlooked and so they chose seven to have oversight of that and we, can, we believe that to be the, basically the institution of the, of the uh, office of deacon in the church who ministered to the physical needs of God's people. Well, Philip was one of those spirit-filled men who was originally chosen to do that. But we saw already in the book of Acts that he had gone on to Samaria to preach the gospel and many of the Samaritans believed. And then after that, he was led by the Spirit to the south road going from Jerusalem to Gaza where he met the Ethiopian eunuch and he preached the gospel to him and he was saved. And the last we heard of him, he proceeded from there to Azotus and made his way to Caesarea preaching the gospel along the way. And now here we see that Philip had settled there, he had married there, and the Lord had blessed him with four daughters, all of whom he had gifted as prophetesses. Now Luke draws our attention to that um, just perhaps to show us again the ongoing work that, that is ongoing outside of what he's focusing on, which is Paul's mission. The book of Acts focuses mainly on Peter and Paul, but there was a lot more that was ongoing through all of the disciples throughout the world. Okay? Now while they were staying there, Agabus the one who earlier had come down from Antioch, which was the center of Gentile Christianity, and had gone to Jerusalem, and who had prophesied uh, through the Spirit the famine that was coming. He came then from Judea, which probably was Jerusalem, that's where Jerusalem is located, and he also began to prophesy. He took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands. You know how the Prophets like to use object lessons and sometimes they, they do things that are symbolic of what's going to take place. Well, he says this was going to happen literally to Paul. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. You know, every time I read that passage, I can't, can't help but think Paul should have taken that belt and basically thrown it in the trash. <laughs> Well, you, you, can't, you can't escape God's will that way. You certainly wouldn't want to give it to somebody else, okay. But what he meant was, you own this, this is what's going to happen to you. But again, how did the disciples react to this? Again, they all began begging Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And again, it shows how much they loved Paul. But again, it also shows something else about them. They knew this was God's will, but they still just couldn't seem to let go of him. And the point I want to bring out is simply this. I mean, we can know God's will without a shadow of a doubt. For us, we essentially can just read the Bible and we know it. But knowing his will doesn't necessarily make it easy, an easy thing to do. Okay? We, we have struggles, and those struggles are with our flesh, basically that remaining sin that's in our hearts. It's going to make it difficult. How many times have we found ourselves struggling to do the will of God, especially when it means we have to give up something that we really love, something we deeply care about, maybe a person, okay, maybe a thing. Why do we struggle? Well, I think we struggle, of course, because of sin. You know, we, we do have to wrestle with sin. But another reason why we may struggle, another reason why they may have struggled is because they, we forget that God's will is always the best, that He has a plan to work even the difficult things that we have to do in our lives for our good. We need to learn to trust Him. Now, I think we see from our passage that Paul did trust the Lord. Okay? He knew this is what God had for him. I'm sure, like Jesus, he didn't necessarily look forward to the suffering, but he did look forward to the good that God was going to bring from it. And because he did, it helped to strengthen the faith of these believers. We read in verse 13, Then Paul answered, as they were begging him not to go, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now again, Paul loved his, his Lord so much, there was nothing that he would not do for him. But again, he also knew that whatever Jesus called him to do, even if it meant suffering, 
it was going to be for the good. It was going to be for His good. It was going to be good for the church. It was going to be good for these disciples. We've actually seen how good it was for them. Now, when He said this, and they saw they couldn't break His resolve, they finally surrendered. We read in verse 14, And since He would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. If we can't get you to change your mind, well then, this must be God's will, and so may that take place. Now, it's possible that even though the Spirit of God had revealed to them that Paul would be arrested and abused in Jerusalem, that they didn't understand that this was God's plan until maybe this moment. Maybe all they knew was the Spirit is warning this is going to happen. Maybe they missed out on that second part of it. But once they understood it, once they knew that it was God's will, they submitted to it because they knew that He knows what it is He's doing. And again, as I remarked before, let's not forget the outcome of what happened. Was Paul wrong? Was the Lord wrong? Of course not. This is what he wrote while a prisoner in Rome. Let me just read a couple of verses from the text we read earlier. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment and the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. By the way, these are the, you know, the soldiers that guard Caesar in Rome. So they were aware of it. And many of them actually converted to Christ. He says, not only to them, but to everyone else as well, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now, as, as we see Paul's resolve, and we see the, the good results of that, I mean, doesn't that give you also in, encouragement? Doesn't that encourage you also to be willing to risk whatever the Lord might call you to risk in order to serve Him? So there, are, there were good things that the Lord brought through this. Paul was not sorry that he went to Jerusalem. He wasn't sorry that he was arrested. He wasn't sorry that he was in Rome. He was rejoicing through, because of what God had done through his imprisonment. If he had not surrendered to God's will, if these believers had talked him out of it, he never would have seen this blessing. Now, we need to see that whatever God wills is best, okay? Wherever He leads us providentially, you know, whatever situations we have to face, we know that God has brought them into our path for a good reason. Now, we don't have the advantage of the Spirit of God speaking to us, you know, personally, the way that these disciples did and the way that Paul did. He doesn't speak to us today in the same way, but He does still speak, he has given to us His will in His Word. We just simply need to, when faced with these situations, we need to trust that what He says to do is the right thing to do, and we need to obey it. You know, Jonathan Edwards, as he was thinking as a young man, how, how can I live my life to the glory of God? How should I do it? He wrote this series of resolutions. There were 70 of them. And in his first one, which is probably one of his longest ones, I, I narrowed it down. He, he basically hits on perhaps the most important one. He says, in my life, resolved, I'm going to do whatever I think to be my duty. And of course, he derives that from the Word of God. And most for the good and advantage of mankind in general. Okay, which of course is what, when you do the Word of God, that is the result. It's not only our duty, but it's for our good and for the good of everyone else. And then he goes on to say, resolved so to do, whatever difficulties I meet with, how many soever, and how great soever. You know, John Gerstner said of Jonathan Edwards that he not only made resolutions, he talks about how people make resolutions, you know, like on New Year's Eve, you know, I'm, I'm going, this year I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And he says most of those resolutions usually are not kept. But Jonathan Edwards, when he made these 70 resolutions, actually lived by these 70 resolutions, again, by the grace of God. This is the kind of life he lived. And, you know, he was faced on one occasion with preaching something to his congregation, which was a huge congregation, something he knew they would not like, they would not accept, that went against everything that they had believed 
on that subject because Solomon Stoddard, his grandfather and their former pastor, had preached it for years and virtually all the churches in the area agreed with him, but he knew he had to preach it because it was in God's Word. And when he did, he also didn't know this, but he believed they were going to kick him out. But he said, I must do this and I must leave the results in God's hand. I must do my duty. This is my duty. It's for their good. It's going to bring perhaps some great difficulties, but I have to do it. So he did it and he was kicked out of the church. Okay? And then he had a hard time for a while trying to find another call and position and he finally found one sort of at a Oh, it was a, what do you call it, Stockbridge, which is um, an outpost, uh, a fort. Uh, he ministered to some settlers there and some Indians, but it was there he was able to write his greatest works for God's glory and the advancement of his church. So God worked that difficult situation for good. And if Edwards had never done that, he'd still be, he would have been pastoring a church of some 700 people versus the smaller church that gave him more time to do the writing. So God had a good purpose in this. The point is, all we need to do is focus on what God calls us to do and just simply do that and not worry about the other circumstances. No, it's going to be difficult. If we do it, it, it is going to mean difficulty. I mean, Paul was arrested. He was beaten. But again, consider the outcome, how God's kingdom advanced. If we want to glorify God, we have to submit to His will and we have to believe, as Paul also believed, that He will work all the difficulties that we have to encounter because we're doing God's will together for our good and the advancement of His kingdom. I think if we look at it in those terms and trust God for the strength that we will be able to do this. But I just want us to see this morning that this is what he calls us to do. Well, let's take just a moment and bow in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply what it is we've just heard from his word, what the Spirit of God is telling us this morning.